In my last video, I took some time to derive converting from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates. So if you haven't seen that and you're uncomfortable with that conversion process, I recommend checking that out before watching this video. The goal of this video is to derive the unit vectors in spherical coordinates. Now in order to do that, we actually have to stay in Cartesian for a little bit longer. Now we can define a position vector r that is written as a combination of the Cartesian unit vectors, scaled to some degree. Now in the previous video that I mentioned, this is the relationship that I derived. Plugging these values into our position vector will give us the following result. You'll notice that in order to obtain this result, all I did was substitute those conversion factors into our x, y, and z components respectively. And what we have here is a common factor of r in all of these terms. So we're going to factor this out. And what we get is that we can write this r vector equal to r. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that each of these can be expressed as some function of theta and phi. So r is going to be written as some scaling factor r times a unit vector r that is a function of both theta and phi. This looks a little abstract at the moment, but it will all come together later. Partially the reason why I'm doing this is to save myself the space of having to write all these terms, and I'm saying that the term that follows after the r usually depends on either theta, phi, or both. Now let's say that we have some arbitrary vector r that depends on some parameter u. Well, we can create a new vector that points in the direction that u is increasing by the following way. We can define some new basis vector equal to the change in r with respect to u. Now this should look similar and should look like the concept of a gradient. With this new vector defined, we can also turn it into a unit vector by dividing it by the magnitude. So we can define e hat of u equal to e vector divided by the magnitude. Nothing crazy here. Now to make this concept more tangible, let's do a simple example. Say we wanted to define a new basis vector, e sub x. Well, based off of this, we would define this as a change in r with respect to x. And if we look at our position vector here, this corresponds to taking the derivative of this vector value function with respect to x. And when we do that, we see that this just gets x hat. And what this corresponds to is the fact that the unit vector in the x direction is just x hat. It's just pointing in the direction that x is increasing. So, so let's see what happens if we define some vector e sub r as a change in this r vector with respect to r. The notation's terrible because it's r and r, but let's, let's just see where this takes us. If we do that, what we end up doing is we take the derivative of this vector here with respect to the parameter r. And that's just equal to our r hat. Well, we can already define what this r hat must be because it's just going to be the r vector divided by the magnitude of r. But since we have an r in each of these terms here, dividing by the magnitude is just going to give us this. So we get e hat sub so r is just going to be equal to cosine theta, or me phi, sine theta, and there we have the first unit vector in spherical coordinates. Next we can define a new vector in terms of theta that's going to be the same concept. We're going to take the derivative of this r vector with respect to theta. Well here's our r vector, so that's going to be Well, this dd theta is blind to this r here, so what this becomes is just r dd theta of this unit vector theta and phi. Okay, the next step is to just take the derivative of this function here sans the r. Remember, we already factored that r out in order to define it as this. So if we do that, we get that this is equal to r well, derivative of sine is just cosine, so this just becomes cosine phi 
cosine theta x hat plus, let's see here, sine phi sine, whoop, that's a cosine, cosine theta y hat uh, minus sine theta z hat. Great. Okay, well now that we have a, a vector for e sub theta, the next step is to just turn it into a unit vector. And we can do that by dividing by the magnitude of all this. And it looks pretty involved, but it's really not too bad. So the magnitude of this is just going to be the square root of r squared times all of this stuff. The beautiful thing about this is that we get a lot of cancellations. So right off the bat, we can factor out a cosine squared theta, and we get that this is equal to cosine squared phi uh, plus sine squared phi. That should look like something to you. Plus sine squared theta. Cosine squared plus sine squared is just 1. And we get that this is, a, this is all square rooted. This is equal to the square root of r squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which again is just 1. And this leads us to the only thing that survives is the square root of r squared, which is just r. So if we divide e theta e sub theta by the magnitude, right, because that's how we turn something into a unit vector, we get that it's just e theta over r. So this whole thing, without the r, becomes the unit vector in the theta direction. For making progress, the last thing that we need to find now is a basis vector that describes the phi direction. And we can do that the same way that we've been doing the other ones. We're going to take the derivative of r with respect to phi. And here we go here. It's blind to the r's yet again. Or it's blind, if, if we're looking at this equation, it's blind to this r. So it's equal to r d d phi of r hat theta and phi. Alright, well this comes out to, if we take the derivative of the first term, what this is equal to, I'm going to keep the r out front, the derivative of cosine phi with respect to phi is just going to be minus sine, so this is minus sine phi sine theta, plus derivative of sine is just cosine and this has an x hat attached to it, sorry. And there's no phi dependence in the z component, so that tells you that the phi basis vector in spherical coordinates has no z dependence. And the next step that we have to do is just to turn this into a unit vector so we can find the magnitude of e sub phi is equal to the square root of r squared. Let's see, so we've got a sine squared phi sine squared theta plus cosine squared phi sine squared theta. What we can do is we can factor out a sine squared theta. So this becomes Okay, and again, we're just going to use the identity that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. 
and this leads us to the square root of r squared sine squared theta, which of course is just r sine theta. Now if you're familiar with the gradient operator and spherical coordinates, all of these scaling factors should start to look a little bit familiar. Okay. So now we know that e magnitude of theta is just r sine theta, which tells us that the final unit vector in spherical coordinates, I might have just said theta, I meant phi, um, is equal to e phi over r sine theta. Okay, we have a sine theta in both of these terms, so they're going to cancel out as well as with the r. So that's going to tell us that that's not what things look like. E phi is equal, again, the r cancels with the r. Uh, the theta cancels with the theta, so this should be equal to minus sine phi x hat plus cosine phi y hat. Perfect. And there we have the three unit vectors for spherical coordinates. I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, next time you're at a party, if someone says to do something crazy, just break out this derivation. The reason I'm making these videos is because I'm slowly building up to a video on deriving the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. So we're slowly but surely building up the pieces. If you guys found this helpful, let me know in the comment section, and I'll see you guys there.